Seasons greetings, video gamers. I'm Shu Tanaka, that's my brother Chan, and we are here to welcome you to a very special Shu and Chan Candlelight Christmas Eve presentation. Are the candles lit, brother? For all anyone knows, yes. Truly, this is the most wonderful time of the year, Chan. Snow gently falling outside, carolers at the door, a roaring fire in the fireplace. The fireplace is in the living room, brother. That's your PC. I think your video card just spontaneously exploded. Oh, so it did. I need to remember to disable the smoke and hair effects on Deus Ex next time I play it. That game needs some optimization. One moment. You know, they really need to start making video cards with vanilla extract or fresh pine scent, so they smell more festive when they melt. Burnt plastic and wiring has kind of a New Year's Eve smell. Sort of fireworks and champagne vomit. Well, regardless, it's Christmas time now. The house is decorated, the presents are wrapped, and the in-chimney security system has been disabled just for one special night to provide Kris Kringle safe passage on his delivery run. We do not want to wake up to another Christmas morning 2013 scenario with all the alarms going off and a fat guy unconscious in the fireplace. It was a few hours inconvenience, brother. That's why we went non-lethal in the first place. Some cookies and a couple gallons of milk to flush the horse tranquilizers out of his system, and he was off like the down of a thistle. I don't recall ever seeing Thistle Down gradually fall asleep at the reins and very slowly steer a flying sleigh into an oak tree. We had to call the fire department, brother. All of which is why the system is disabled, Chen. Besides, it's an ill wind that blows no warmth that was years ago and we haven't had to buy charcoal for summertime grilling since. I suppose we should count our blessings. It is Christmas time after all. Exactly! Christmas time when goodwill is abundant and sales of chipmunk-sized hula hoops increase 900%. And we have an extra special holiday treat for you tonight, video gamers. For tonight, we are doing a retrospective of every major Christmas-themed video game ever made. We'll be starting with... Christmas Nights into Dreams for the Sega Saturn. And after that... That is literally the only Christmas video game ever made. What, really? Can you think of any others? Well, yes, obviously. It's Christmas. Of course there are Christmas video games. Such as... Well, there's the, uh... That one with all the snow. Skyrim, John Carpenter's The Thing. There has to be other Christmas games, brother. There are mobile games and shovelware, and there are a few major titles that are set at Christmas, but aren't actually Christmas-themed. Outside of occasional holiday modes for online multiplayer games, AAA gaming doesn't seem to do much Christmas. Huh. We could play through Home Alone for the NES. No, no, no need to go that far. I remember Nights of the Dreams fondly. We can probably stretch the presentation around that, so... Yes! Okay, video gamers, tonight we'll be doing an unusually in-depth retrospective of Christmas Nights into Dreams. Let's get this holiday train on the tracks! We're just going to play Christmas Nights. We used to play it all the time. I think we can handle another ten-minute session. Let's get started. There is no way I can handle ten minutes of this. Am I having a seizure, brother? No, this is the game. I just don't remember it looking so... so... I mean, you're seeing this too, right? It's like if a fruitcake imploded in on itself and then became its own universe. How did we used to play this all the time? Were we high? Maybe these are the recurring visions of sugar plums that plagued sleeping children in the 19th century. A prelude to madness. Well, uh, so far as commentary, the... Gameplay consists of flying back and forth, and you make loops that capture bells and such, and uh, presumably it goes on like this until your head explodes like that guy in scanners. Can we end this before our retina detach, preferably? Right, fair enough. Okay, that did not go as planned. Let me check the phone book, see if anyone has a copy of the NES Home Alone. You know, we're not contractually obligated to watch video games, brother. It's Christmas Eve. There are a host of Christmas traditions from all around the globe we could be examining. It's a time for food, celebration, and family. Oh no, family arrives tomorrow. We don't need any of that noise trumping in here early. Let me have just one more good night's rest before having to justify the video game industry to father or explain to mother why I don't already have four children at my age. In Germany and Norway, a popular tradition is to serve guests a Christmas pudding, and the individual whose pudding contains a hidden almond is awarded a tiny pig made out of marzipan, signifying luck in the coming year. Huh. I prefer the American tradition where we cut out the middleman and simply serve a pig made out of pig meat. 
signifying another year of port products. The door, brother. I don't know who's out there, but if they're not bringing a present, they're getting the hose. Justify yourself, holiday interloper. What on earth were you doing outside at this time of night, Arnie? Tracking Santa Claus, I have developed an app that aggregates data from NORAD, Google, and the Royal Air Force to pinpoint Santa's location at any given time. Why that level of precision, Arnie? Well, I figured with that many organizations keeping him under surveillance, there had to be some kind of bounty. I borrowed some horse tranquilizers, by the way. Those do work. We are not taking out Santa Claus tonight. All we're doing tonight is, well, okay, I don't actually know what we're doing. Our Christmas gaming marathon seems to have fallen through. We could go caroling. I've been practicing all I want for Christmas is you in the shower. Yes, the neighbors do kind of have that coming after letting their dog poop on our lawn so many times. But it's too cold right now, and also it requires getting up again. What else have we got? We could watch a movie. Yeah, I know all kinds of good Christmas specials. You know no such thing, Arnie. I've seen your Netflix queue. It's full of Hallmark Channel movies with names like A Wish for Magic and Replacement Christmas Dad. The most normal thing on there is that one Twilight Zone episode where Tim Allen assassinates Santa Claus, who curses him with his dying breath. Maybe something from the classics. Perhaps one of the 7,000 film versions of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. That's more like it. And I have just the version, something old, slower paced from back when the film studios vastly overestimated audience attention spans. Can I make some popcorn? Sure, there's a 60% chance we'll still be awake when you get back. Let's roll film! Do you know how many film versions of A Christmas Carol actually exist, brother? I don't think anyone's keeping count at this point. Between movies, cartoons, television specials, foreign language adaptations, spin-offs, knockoffs, and parodies, we have to be approaching the quadruple digit at this point. That's a testament to the timeless, enduring appeal of an inspiring holiday masterpiece that you don't have to pay anything to make a movie version of. Score one for public domain source material. It's Ebenezer Scrooge approved. Well, we have no doubt that his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner, Okay, I'm back. What did I miss? Who are these guys? Arnie, we're watching A Christmas Carol. Who do you think those guys are? The 1986 Chicago Bears? The cast of Welcome Back, Cotter, maybe? All right, all right, I get it. Admittedly, the gentleman playing Scrooge looks a little bit like a schnauzer. You know, for people who have watched A Christmas Carol as much as you have, you don't seem to have taken much of the message to heart. Isn't the whole thing about Scrooge learning to treat his fellow man better, and his employee in particular? On the contrary, Arnie, if you actually watch the movie, you'll see that Scrooge's parsimonious is established by him blocking Bob Cratchit's access to coal for the fire, whereas circumstances have left us absolutely lousy with this stuff, so by the standards of the film, we're amongst the most generous employers in the world. Go on, take a Christmas bonus in charcoal. Grab a shovel. We are also still very well stocked on old potatoes, if you need any of those. I don't feel this adequately answers my concerns, but I also don't want to pass up free charcoal, so I guess that's a wash. I do still get Christmas Day off, right? Remind me again, Arnie, what exactly it is that you do do when you are working for us, and how that differs from what you do when you have a day off. I'm not telling. Fifteen shillings a week with a wife and a family, talking about a merry Christmas. <laughs> I'll retire to Bedlam. I'm assuming that John Netherway was an old English euphemism for genitalia. Now we're getting spooky. Here's the part of the story where Scrooge is visited by the spirit of his long-dead business partner, Jacob Marley, who this must be distinctly understood, is as dead as a doornail. Gross. I'm having trouble distinctly understanding that because in this shot, he appears to be as alive as a door knocker. Well, yes, brother. Clearly, that's why they had to draw attention to the issue. Charles Dickens must have gone through the first draft and realized he was giving off the impression that Marley was just a guy who liked to pull pranks where he superimposed his head on a doorknob, and so he wrote that in to compensate. But he kept the door theming. Well, yes, that was kind of Marley's brand. He was like a 1960s Batman villain, but for door components. The most interesting thing about Marley's visitation is realizing that Ebenezer Scrooge apparently suffered vivid hallucinations from poorly prepared foodstuffs with such regularity that that was his immediate explanation for having an actual ghost talking to him. These were a people who pioneered the jellying of Eel's brother. Would we really be surprised to find their gravy was frequently made out of cane toads or poison tree frogs or something? Just another slimy, boiled thing for the pot as far as they were concerned. Ho, 
Holy smoke, look at the legions of the undead out there. That must have been some really potent mustard. Why all this scary stuff at Christmas? It never really caught on in America, Arnie, but ghost stories have been part of the British Christmas tradition since long before A Christmas Carol was published. It just seems a little morbid for the happiest time of the year. Well, you have to consider the time period. Sure, people back then wanted a happy Christmas. Who wouldn't? But when you factor in the state of healthcare, housing, hygiene in those days, it was just as likely that you'd wake up on Christmas morning to advance plague symptoms or your house burning down. Basically, all the dark Christmas traditions boiled down to people of the time kind of hedging their holiday bets. Oh, that's dark. It's hard to hold a proper Christmas party when the bedroom everyone throws their coats in is already occupied by the corpse of a family member waiting to be interred after the spring thaw. You know, since we're already on the subject, this is the ghost of Christmas past, right? I assume so. What are we looking for in the way of verification? Being see-through is usually good enough for me. No, I mean he's a ghost. He's not the steward of Christmas past or the elected representative of Christmas past. If I'm reading the source material right, we are to understand that this guy was the literal personification of Christmas past back when he was alive... Somehow he died, and now this is his restless shade, 100% dead. Has it going now? Careful, Arnie, that's Jacob Marley territory, it's trademarked. I don't think that's quite what the movie was implying, brother. I imagine he's the ghost of Christmas past in the same way any given person becomes man of the year. Just an ordinary ghost who the ethereal Christmas organization chose to represent them. But he is dead, yes? Well, clearly. Probably died in some exceptionally festive manner to get the attention of the higher-ups. Mistletoe poisoning or bad eggnog or something. Getting run over by a reindeer? You're on thin ice, Arnie. I never liked this part of the movie. It's boring and depressing. Supervillain origin stories are supposed to have way more action. I'm not sure Ebenezer Scrooge really counts as a supervillain, Arnie. Particularly this version. This guy projects more of a diseased vagrant image. He's the Ebenezer Scrooge you'd meet muttering to himself in the bus station at 3 a.m. I do like Fezziwig, though. The character or just the silly name? Excuse me, this was Victorian England, his surname most likely related to his family's trade. They probably manufactured hair pieces. Ah, I see where you're going with that. They made fuzzy wigs then? No, fezzy ones. Shaped like a fez. The hair's all formed into a cylinder right on top of the head with one braid hanging down for a tassel. Look, I didn't come up with Victorian fashions. I'm coming. Come in. Come in. <laughs> I can sort of accept this as a personification of Christmas present, but in my experience, he'd be about a thousand times fatter. And constantly complaining about his in-laws. I like this part of the movie where the ghosts take Scrooge around and they get to see everybody doing Christmas stuff. Why can't the whole movie be like this? In other words, take out the central plot and just show footage of Christmas parties. I know what I like. This is an important part of the story, though. Not only does it establish that Scrooge, through his selfishness, has essentially condemned Tiny Tim to an early death, it also shows Ebenezer that despite his wealth, his life is infinitely emptier than the merry, wretchedly impoverished lives of the Hillbilly Cratchit clan. Hillbilly's brother? Well, there's some geographical transposition, Chan. I can't pretend to know all the cultural idioms of London in the 1800s. But I'm confident that if this were set in America, the Cratchits would be depicted dancing around barefoot in a tar paper shack with their 11 kids and 17 coonhounds, toothless bearded Jim Bob Cratchit with his banjo at the ready, tiny Tim keeping rhythm on an empty moonshine jug as the family's washing machine rusts gently on the front lawn. The Cratchits are now approximately 60% less endearing, brother. Think Emmett Otter, but caked in way more filth. Speaking of filth, I'm going to go on record again as saying it's a little weird and in no small way impractical that the ghost of Christmas present travels everywhere with two shriveled, dirty street urchins tucked away under his robes. It would make it really hard to walk. He'd be punting them along like footballs. We also only have his word to go on that they're actually representations of ignorance and want. For all we know, they're regular kids. The ghost of Christmas present has a really rich diet, as you've seen. A few days down there dodging intermittent party food squeakers could turn anyone feral. Behold, it's the ghost of Christmas future. 
Yeah, he looks about as futuristic as Ingmar Bergman. Not exactly Tron, is he? My Ghost of Christmas Future would be wearing a skin-tight silver bodysuit and a Geordie LaForge visor. I can say in all honesty, brother, that I would be very interested in seeing your version of A Christmas Carol. You know, I'll bet Scrooge's first thought when the ghost took him here wasn't so much, am I dead, as, oh crap, do I end up as a pawnbroker? I believe the correct term here is rag and bone merchant. Rag and bone merchant? Like a junk dealer. But why would they call them rag and bone merchants? Well, because they originally used to collect and sell rags and bones. Why would you want to buy rags and bones? I guess if you got enough of them, you could tie them together and make your own Thunderdome. That version of A Christmas Carol I would definitely like to see. You know, Mr. Magoo actually was a pretty good choice to play Ebenezer Scrooge, since they're both on about the same level when it comes to getting the message. You do not want to pick Scrooge for your Pictionary team. Really, the Ghost of Christmas Future had to be mute, or else this segment would be like 30 seconds long. It's you, Scrooge, you're dead, and nobody likes you. Done. Are you hungry? Maybe he can talk, and he just had a bet going with all the other spirits that he could coast through the whole thing by pointing dramatically. You know, like Mario speedruns, where they never hit the jump button. I'm not the man I was. Believe me, believe me, I'm not the man I was. And voila! The spirits grant Ebenezer a second chance to keep him from staining up their robes with any more blubbery tears of cowardice. Hurrah! I like this part. Nothing but happy times and smooth sailing from here on. Yeah, at least that's the part they're showing us. What we're seeing here is essentially the same behavior you get out of a coworker the first week they give up red meat or starch in their diets. Just the manic part of their mood swing. They're not even feeling the first sugar cravings yet, they're just high on their own optimism. Oh, that's just cynical. I'm not saying Scrooge reverts to his old ways. Canonically, the book establishes that he remains a changed man for the rest of his life. All I'm saying is that it kind of glosses over any hint of an internal struggle with his old nature. Being a good person doesn't mean that you never have dark thoughts, it just means that you keep yourself from acting on them. I don't care what version of the story you're selling, if you're telling me that Scrooge's first impulse now when some red-haired tween vagrant shows up on his doorstep warbling an off-key version of God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, isn't still to toss the contents of the chamber pot right onto his hideous little head, and he doesn't overcome it by rigidly enforced self-discipline, then you're missing a very important point about the nature of redemption. I just like that he's nice now. I suppose on Christmas Eve we can let that suffice for a moral lesson. Another important lesson, if you're dealing with the kind of sanitation system that was available in 1840s London, maybe you shouldn't let your kids grope a raw dead bird with their bare hands in your living room. I've been there. You're a strange, unhygienic little rodent, Arnie. Well, I for one am glad to see that this tale has a happy ending. Or any ending at all, really, because I am now very much ready for a long winter's nap. Let's wrap this up, shall we? Ooh, I can do it. I'm good at wrapping things up. You're really not, Arnie. As evidence, I submit the pair of socks you gifted me last year, upon which you used two cubic yards of wrapping paper, seven feet of scotch tape, lost the socks out of the package entirely, and somehow still managed to get the entire mess glued to the back of your head without noticing it. Well, it's not like it'll get better without practice. I think we can handle this one. Thank you for watching this very special Shu and Chan presentation, video gamers. If you enjoyed this video, share it with your loved ones. If you're unsure of the reception, consider sharing it after they give you your presents. Remember that you can also directly support the creation of new videos at our Patreon page linked below. Give the world the gift of more us. From all of us here at Tanaka Brothers Game Development, myself, Chan, Arnie, Gila Mobster, Whatever other talking vermin have infested our offices, hey. we bid you all the merriest of Merry Christmases. But we still didn't get you anything. We do still have a line on some reasonably priced charcoal, though. And a Happy New Year!